from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor-at-large of the journal. If you're not already a subscriber to Free Expression, please do sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you do your listening. This week, the Democratic presidential race. Is Joe Biden a lock for his party's nomination? Or could an unlikely challenger somehow bring him down? We're going to take a look at the Democratic contest with, so far, the president's only declared rival. Well, even Christmas, it seems, is down on Joe Biden. On Tuesday, just days after it had been erected and strung with fairy lights, the national Christmas tree on a plot of land across from the White House called the President's Park crashed to the ground in a storm. As a metaphor for Joe Biden's political fortunes, it was certainly timely, if not very seasonal. With less than a year to go until an especially momentous presidential election, an ill wind is blowing through the Democratic Party, rattling its leadership and weakening its foundations. As it howls around the White House, the party's top strategists are increasingly alarmed that it could topple the president himself. Opinion polls now consistently show Donald Trump defeating Biden next year in the national vote. And in the critical swing states, Trump's advantage seems, if anything, stronger. The same polls show that voters think Biden is just too old to be president for another term. But is there any way at all that Biden will not be the Democratic Party's nominee next year? My guest this week certainly thinks so. Dean Phillips is a third-term Democratic congressman from Minnesota. Democrats who fear that Biden is a liability next year hope that Phillips might be able to do to the president what Eugene McCarthy did to Lyndon Johnson in 1968, doing well enough in the New Hampshire primary to drive the president out of the race. But this long-shot effort is even longer than McCarthy's was in 1968. Democrats have changed their rules this year, meaning that the Granite State has lost its status as the first in the nation to go for a primary. The state's decision to go ahead with its vote on January the 23rd means that any delegates that are won in the primary contest that day may not actually be awarded. Joe Biden's name is not even on the ballot. What's more, polling suggests that despite the doubts about the president, he remains the very firm favourite for the party's nomination. So can Dean Phillips change the dynamics of that race with just seven weeks to go before those first votes, kind of votes, are cast? Dean Phillips joins me now. Congressman, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. So great to be with you, Jerry. Thank you. So you are, it seems, certainly the only sort of serious politician, shall we say, willing to challenge Joe Biden. Why do you think everybody else is so reluctant? What makes you the only one to do it? Well, Jerry, I have to tell you, uh, sadly, I've discovered that we have a culture of fear, a culture of silence, a culture of sitting down and getting in line during times where we need people to lead. And I don't think it's unique to the American political culture right now. I think it's actually pervasive around the world. And fear is driving bad decisions, bad outcomes, uh, and limiting the very participation that I think we need at such a consequential time. And I surely have torpedoed my career in Congress, which I'm okay with. And I simply wish there were more people willing to torpedo their careers and not torpedo the country. You said recently that you think it's delusional to think that Joe Biden can defeat Donald Trump. Now, the polling suggests, yeah, Trump seems to have a lead, a very small lead. You know, it's within a couple of points in the average of the polls. There's a lot can happen in the next year. What makes you absolutely so convinced that Joe Biden can't win? Well, Jerry, and you're right about that in the national polls. But as you well know, in our electoral college system, what really matters are the battleground states. And if you look at the data from the most important battleground states, President Biden is losing to Donald Trump in five of the six. His approval numbers are now reaching historic lows. And then there's the anecdotal evidence of conversations with voters all around the country, certainly my constituents, disaffected independents, never Trump Republicans, part of the coalition that one needs to win, not to mention the most important members of the Democratic coalition, which are young voters. You probably know this, that under 30 voters are favoring Joe Biden equally now with Donald Trump. And 83 percent of Democratic voters under 30 uh, say they want a different nominee. So perhaps it's because I come from the business world and I believe in numbers and data. I know that politicians lie way too much, but numbers don't. And the numbers right now are screaming that Joe Biden will lose to Donald Trump in the next election. Now, there's a chance, of course, Biden could win. And I admit that, if you will. But I think it's imperative that there be a next generation candidate who's ready to serve, who's competent, prepared, energetic. And in competition, because coronations are not what this country are founded on. Competitions are. 
And that's why I'm doing it. What makes you think that it's Joe Biden that's unpopular and not the Democratic Party? The polling I've seen in the last couple of weeks, some polls matching Donald Trump against Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, or Governor Gavin Newsom of California. Trump beats both of them. And I, you know, I dare say, forgive me for saying this so directly to you, I dare say he beats you too. What makes you think that Biden is the problem and not your party? Well, no, I think what you just said is true, by the way. In a national election, I do agree. I think both Vice President Harris and Governor Newsom would lose national elections. That's what the data tells me. I believe that come May or June of next year, when I'm introduced to our country, that you'll see those very same polls show that I will be beating Donald Trump while the others would be losing to him. You asked about Democrats. No, it's actually just the opposite. Voters still choose candidates. And as evidenced by recent outcomes in the last election earlier in November, where a moderate Democrat was reelected in red Kentucky, even in Ohio, uh, red Ohio, where Voters favored to codify women's reproductive rights and legalize cannabis. So, no, I don't think we have a Democratic Party issue. I think we have a Democratic candidate issue. And I think in 2020, Joe Biden was probably one of the only ones, Jerry, who could have defeated Donald Trump. And in 2024, I believe he's one of the very few who could lose to him. And as the second most bipartisan member of the United States Congress, as the vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus in the last Congress, a former member of Democratic House leadership, and now of course, the ranking member of the Middle East subcommittee. My wheelhouse is both bipartisanship, team of rivals, and putting together a coalition of common sense, which this country has been devoid of, I believe, for far too long. Uh, But I will follow the data, and I'll just finish with this. Come next June or so, when head-to-head polls are out showing how Democrats would perform against Donald Trump, if President Biden is winning and beating Trump and I'm behind, of course, I would do the right thing for my country, and which is to bow out and get behind him. Conversely, if he is still in the race at that time, and I'm ahead of Trump and he's behind, I would ask him and the Democratic Party to get behind the winner. And that's what I intend to do. You've talked a lot about Joe Biden's age. The polling does suggest that people are very, very uncomfortable with his age. It seems like a vast majority of Americans actually think that he's too old, frankly, to put it but bloody to be president. Is it the age that's the primary problem for you? No, I, in fact, I know that's been attributed to me. What I'm referring to is the fact that polls are indicating that Americans feel that his age is uh, making him unelectable. And that is pretty evident. By the way, what I didn't mention moments ago, Jerry, is the most important data that I've seen recently in two different polls show that a generic Democrat, a generic Democrat beats Donald Trump 48 to 40, while Donald Trump beats Joe Biden 48 to 44. That's a 12 point difference. So what that is saying, by the way, I've never aspired to be generic. You can imagine that, but you can attach any label to me, call me any name, attack me in any way you wish, as long as it defeats Donald Trump. And that's exactly what I intend to do. You've said the polling shows that voters are very uncomfortable with someone of that age. Is age his primary problem? Well, again, this is coming from the data. And I think it's imperative that those in elected office use the data available. In this case, it's saying that both men, not just President Biden, that both men are perceived as too old for the job. As you know, Donald Trump is only four years younger than Joe Biden. And I don't think it's fair to President Biden to only reference his age when both are clearly in the dusk of life. I think it's fair to say actuarially. And that is an issue for American voters. But I'll tell you the bigger issue, Jerry, is unaffordability. The income and wealth disparities in the United States are tragic. I think they will lead to the demise of the United States no matter who becomes president. I think a faster demise if it's Donald Trump who does not appreciate, care for, or feel responsibility to protecting democracy, in my estimation. But those inequities and the lack of the unaffordability of life for so many Americans is what is on the minds of almost everybody with whom I'm speaking, Jerry. And when you have a macro economy and GDP growth that is outstripping most OECD countries, our inflation rate is actually now lower than most of those, job growth, wage growth, economic growth, The problem is it's accruing to far too few of Americans. And AI, by the way, down the road is going to only make those gaps, I think, bigger. And I think we need an all hands on deck approach to raising the foundation of the necessities for American families. That's health care, child care, education, housing, the core elements of surviving in a 21st century world. I think that's the solution. And that is what people are most upset about from a policy perspective is the unaffordability of their lives. Bidenomics. I mean, you talk about unaffordability and Bidenomics, but didn't you vote for, I think, every single measure that Joe Biden, every economic measure from economic stimulus to the IRA to all the measures to which some economists do attribute the inflation and the unaffordability problem we've had? I mean, haven't you been completely on board with the Biden agenda? Yeah, but Jerry, I absolutely have, and I'm proud of it because I think that 
is what positioned the United States to outperform every OECD country as it relates to economic performance and now lower inflation rate than many. But that is the entire issue. Those investments, I think very important ones, infrastructure, the CHIPS Act, which repatriates American manufacturing, particularly semiconductor manufacturing, the Inflation Reduction Act. Of course, you know, we can have debates about the exact policies, the underlying elements, but these were not initiatives designed to lower the cost of living for Americans. And I believe therein lies the gap. You asked me about why are people upset? They believe that the current administration is not well equipped and does not understand how difficult life is for so many. And right now, Jerry, 60 percent of Americans, 60 percent are living paycheck to paycheck. 40 percent cannot afford a four hundred dollar emergency expense. That's not just tragic. It is going to be, I believe, lead to the demise over time if we do not somehow rectify these gaps. And I do not believe in I'm a capitalist. I'm a businessman. I built businesses, sold them. I believe deeply in how democracy enables capitalism. I do believe we have to be using a more compassionate form, perhaps, and encourage more sharing, have an ownership economy. But at the end of the day, I do not intend to redistribute income. I do intend to work with any of the willing, Democrats, Republicans, independents, to raise the basic foundation for American lives so that families don't have to spend 99% of their income just to get by if they can even do that. And I think that's something that both conservatives and progressives can unify behind. Well, again, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding why that differentiates you from the president. I mean, Biden surely just articulated pretty well all the same kind of views and approach towards the economy that Joe Biden has. And indeed, you know, Joe Biden would argue that's what Bidenomics represents. Well, it hasn't, though. And Jerry, I'm pointing that out right now. Unfortunately, what Bidenomics has come to represent is higher prices and inflation. And that's just the truth. This is, again, I will be tagged of saying things that are coming from me. I'm repeating what the data is indicating, what people are sharing with me, and that is life has become more unaffordable than more affordable. And these initiatives, in my estimation, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember voting for anything that would have the intention of lowering prices for Americans. What I just referenced, health care, child care, elder care, by the way, the child tax credit, earned income tax credit, housing, and frankly, pre-K education for all, to give people a higher foundation. Those are ways that over time can, I think, reduce costs and better prepare young people in particular for productive careers. And it's how you spend your political capital. The president was very successful in spending his political capital on the initiatives that he found most important. As president, I will spend mine on what I consider most important, and that is affordability for Americans. Now, when you're running against an incumbent, and when you're something, I think it's fair to say, you'll acknowledge you're an underdog, running against the incumbent, you need all the weapons you can get. And you've highlighted the concerns people have about Biden's age. You've said, as things stand, looks like he's going to lose to Donald Trump. You've disagreed now with some of his economic proposals. What about the, his family and the issues that Republicans have been raising with, you know, with sort of growing intensity over uh, in what we initially called the Hunter Biden scandal, but which, as we learn more and more about, it does seem that presidents certainly knew a lot more than he initially claimed about what's going on. How vulnerable do you think that makes the president and to what extent are you prepared to go after him for it? Well, let me start by saying, Jerry, that I believe President Biden to be a man of better character and principle than former President Trump. But I also believe in the truth. And if the evidence ultimately is disclosed that the president did something either unethical or even worse, illegal, of course, I will acknowledge it the same way such evidence has been presented as it relates to the past president. Two things are true. The president's son has clearly done some misdeeds that I find to be very troubling. And his brother has also, in some ways, it looks like. I've not seen evidence that leads directly to the president. And I do believe that we should still be a nation of laws and innocence until proven guilty. But like I said, facts are facts. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. Senator Menendez, a Democrat, extraordinarily unethical. I cannot believe he's still a member of the Senate. And George Santos, a Republican. I cannot believe he's still a member of the House. That might change, as you know. I should say we're recording this as as uh, it's actually happening happening in the House. Yeah. And this goes back to what you've been kind of pushing on here, Jerry, and it's very true. In a nation in which perception, as it relates to politics, perception is what drives outcomes. And I am afraid, very afraid, that the president, A, is unelectable, both because of his age and because of his policies. And I also am increasingly believing that he might be unelectable because of a perception of unethical behavior that will tie him in some ways to even the Trump family. I don't believe that to be the case or the truth. But like I said, perception is what matters. And I will do anything to prevent a return of Donald Trump to the White House. And that is exactly why some of these challenges the president is facing, I believe, altogether lead to his 
on electability. We must take a short break there, but when we come back, I'll have more with Congressman Dean Phillips, Joe Biden's primary challenger for the Democratic nomination. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Dean Phillips, congressman from Minnesota, and Joe Biden's only challenger for the Democratic primary nomination. Let's look at foreign affairs, obviously, what's going on in the world right now, the war in Ukraine, which we can come to. But I want to talk about, uh, obviously, the Middle East, the war between Israel and Hamas. Again, as we record this, we're still on whatever it is, day five or six of this ceasefire as Israel attempts to get more of its hostages and hostages from around the world released. Are you happy with the way in which Joe Biden's been very supportive, at least up till now, of Israel? But at the same time, he does seem to be increasing the pressure on Israel to maybe to maintain this ceasefire, to maintain this sort of diplomatic approach. What's your take? Well, I do believe he's handled it quite well, and it is not a place for an opponent or a member of Congress to impugn a sitting president during times of great challenge, including wars. But I will say this, a couple things. I am disappointed in the fact that we still have, I believe, eight or nine American hostages still being held by Hamas, a terrorist organization in Gaza. We are now over seven weeks into this. And I don't recall a time in my life other than in 1979 with the Iran hostage crisis in which so many Americans were held by a regime or terrorist group for so long without any effort that I've seen beyond negotiation to extract them. The United States is the strongest kinetic force in the world. We have the most extraordinary diplomatic corps. We have tools that are unimaginable to most nations. And I find it, frankly, appalling and very troubling that every day our president is not in front of the country demanding their release and actually deploying, in the case of special forces or other means, their extraction. And I know that's not easy. And I do not want to share any intelligence or compromise anybody. But I got to tell you, Jerry, I think that is a failure so far, and it's deeply troubling. Now, I believe in his support of Israel is very important, uh, as is his support of Ukraine. I think that is to be celebrated. But I will also say this. You know, I'm 54 years old. The president has been in Washington since I was three years old. And the generation, the current generation of leadership from the West Bank to the West Wing is responsible for this situational, consistent cycle of bloodshed. And I'm sick of it. Democrats and Republicans are sick of it. The Muslim American community, the Jewish American community are sick of it. And I believe it's time for change, both in the West Bank and Gaza. Hamas must be eliminated. It is time for the Palestinian Authority to go. They are corrupt. They pay to slay. They pay terrorists who will kill Israelis. I'd also believe Prime Minister Netanyahu has mismanaged Israel I believe his government holds some accountability for the failure in intelligence and military failure of October 7th. And I believe his settlement policy has created the ground for such destruction. And I hope Israelis will choose peace. And I hope Palestinians will choose peace and a new generation of leaders because this cycle has got to end. I'm the ranking member of the Middle East Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs. I've been to the region twice in just the last number of months, met with the prime minister, Netanyahu, been to Riyadh, been to Turkey pushing for normalization between the Saudis and Israelis. And I believe we were very close. And I do suspect that Iran probably inspired that attack on October 7th to prevent the very peace, which so many of us were pushing for, to ensure that there would be an Israeli overreaction, and frankly, to make this more difficult. And once again, they've succeeded. And I'm getting very, very tired of generations of American leadership that have allowed this Iranian regime to act with impunity and create crisis after crisis after crisis, because eventually those will come to our shores. And I think we have to act in a different way moving forward. Do you think the Biden administration's approach towards Iran, the attempt to get the nuclear deal back on track, some of the kind of what some people have called appeasement, the releasing of funds to Iran that had been frozen, do you think that's actually emboldened Iran and maybe that carries some responsibility for what's happened with Hamas? Well, Jerry, I'm a realist. And when the American hostages, those who were held by Iran, were released with the release of the dollars, I was one of the very few Democrats that did not support it. I did so publicly. I took some heat for it, as you can imagine. But I think in no small way, that's exactly why Hamas is holding Americans right now. I think that's exactly the kind of behavior that incentivizes the taking of Americans and holding them in return for a reward. Because if not, why would they have not released those Americans already, is what I would argue. So yes, I think that was a mistake. Iran can never acquire a nuclear weapon, period. The entire world, China included, by the way, I believe feels the same, and we should be unifying behind that. Jerry, we're reaching a point where 
it will not be long before a nuclear weapon can be carried in a backpack. And if we don't recognize what is forthcoming between weapons of mass destruction that can be placed in backpacks, when artificial intelligence can operate robots of war, when they can spread misinformation, disinformation, and actually create it, completely eliminating the ability for human reasoning, we have to prepare. And I'm just afraid that the current generation of leaders in this world, not just in the United States, but around the world, are ill-prepared. And we had a chance in late 2022 during the Iranian uprising, especially women who were protesting that horrible regime. I think we have to prepare new tactics, new approaches, new tools to promote those who desire freedom. We have never been a country that is good at imposing democracy. We've never been good at regime change. We are pretty good at promoting uh, those who desire freedom. And I think that should be the foremost leg of our foreign policy stool moving forward, using social media, using the tools and techniques of the 21st century to inspire, promote, and help those who seek the same freedoms and liberties uh, to which we've become accustomed and frankly, I think, for which we take for granted. What about Ukraine? You said you supported the president's uh, approach to Ukraine, which obviously so far has involved the provision of significant amounts of military and financial support, but obviously no direct U.S. military engagement. Is that approach working? Well, I do believe it is, Jerry, but I have to say that I think his approach to Ukraine has been very important and one that I have supported. However, it's also, and somewhat analogous, I would argue, to setting a fire and then pretending you're the fire department and putting it out. In 2014, when he was the vice president with President Obama, and Vladimir Putin who entered and took Crimea with impunity. Nothing done to prevent it, nothing done to stop it, and nothing done to rectify it. And we all know what type of man Vladimir Putin is. He takes an inch, waits for the reaction, and then he'll take his mile. And that's exactly what he did. I think there is a reason he waited to do it under this administration. And now, yes, we have to support Ukraine. Now, should the Europeans be supporting this effort more than they are now? Darn right they should. It's in their backyard. It is their responsibility. uh, And it should not just be left to the United States of America. But if we abandon Ukraine right now, the message it sends not just to Putin, but to President Xi, to the Iranian regime, to the North Koreans, to any country that is opposed to freedom and democracy, it would be tragic. And we do have a responsibility. I'm also concerned, Jerry, about a post-Putin Russia, the brain drain, a failed nation, a nuclear armed nation uh, that will be guideless for a period of time. We have to be taking steps right now, anticipating, being prepared for dramatic changes in the world order and an alignment of an axis of evil that surely does not have the United States' best interest in mind. To the contrary, wishes to undermine us and ultimately destroy our way of living. And again, it's time for 21st century thinkers, leaders, doers, in a bipartisan fashion, by the way. It's time for the right and the left in the United States to unify to protect the very freedoms and liberties and blessings that so many have given their lives to protect, including my own father in the Vietnam War, one of one million Americans who've given their lives to protect this extraordinary country. And I'm getting really tired of the right and left in America and our Congress and our country fighting each other. It's time to fight for one another and fight those who would oppose our freedoms and our blessings. We very much appreciate that. And we're very mindful of your father's sacrifice and service. Back to the campaign itself. You announced your campaign, what, less than two months ago, about six weeks ago? Only a month ago, October 27th. Just a month ago. So Mm -hmm. is it fair to say you're kind of putting all your chips on New Hampshire? No, and I understand why you might say that. I'm certainly investing heavily in New Hampshire as the first in the nation primary. Uh, Of course, it wasn't that long ago, 1968, when another relatively unknown Minnesotan, Senator Eugene McCarthy, surprised the country, shocked the country by almost upsetting President Johnson, who soon thereafter dropped out of the race, opening the door for Bobby Kennedy, of course. New Hampshire is an interesting state that can deeply affect the outcome of elections. And yes, of course, I intend to surprise there. I don't make any guarantees. I will be competitive, I think, in a number of states. But Jerry, I will say this. What really matters is not New Hampshire or Michigan or any other state. What matters is next May or June, when the head-to-head polls come out closer to the general election, we should all make our choice then. Which candidate is best positioned to defeat who I believe is the most dangerous man in American history? That's Donald Trump. If it is President Biden, so be it. I will acknowledge it and wrap it up and get behind him. If it is me, I would hope he would do the same. And frankly, if it's somebody else, we should all do the same thing because I do believe, no matter your politics or perspectives, that another four years with Donald Trump in this country will be a tragedy that will be very, very hard to reverse. So there are a lot of ways to success. And I intend to stay in the race and raise the resources 
be energetic, introduce myself to voters, answer their questions, and most importantly, be available. I think it's a responsibility of those who compete to lead the most extraordinary nation in the world and the most powerful seat in the world to show up, to debate, to appear in front of voters, to make their case, not just for the past, but for the future. And I believe it's incumbent on the incumbent to do so. And I will be encouraging that. And I will be running a very spirited campaign, I believe, until the end. You just mentioned the 1968 precedent, which is on everybody's mind, of course, as you said, Eugene McCarthy against Lyndon Johnson, forcing Lyndon Johnson out of the race. Is that, frankly, what you think could happen here? I mean, famously, of course, McCarthy didn't win that New Hampshire primary, but came so close that it was seen as a big defeat for Lyndon Johnson. If you were able to achieve something similar here, would you welcome, you know, the entry into the race at that point of other people, you know, with people we've talked about, maybe Gavin Newsom and Kamala Harris and others? Oh, Jerry, in fact, I'd been spending the better part of the last year encouraging that. Uh, first, encouraging the president to pass the torch. I believe it would have been the best way to serve our country, to cement his legacy, which I'm in very deeply afraid if he is the nominee will be not just stained, but will be a tragedy both for him and for the country. I made personal calls to two of the candidates that I think would be very able, well-prepared and successful, Governor Whitmer and Governor Pritzker in Illinois. Uh, They wouldn't even take my calls. I made public appeals to other prepared Democrats. That includes Vice President Harris. That includes Governor Newsom. But as I've said recently, you know, the water's warm, Jerry. Jump in. This is a democracy. This is a primary designed to offer voters alternatives. The absence of alternatives is the destruction of democracy. Competition is its vitamin. And I'm astounded that some of the most well-known, highly regarded, successful politicians on the Democratic Party have taken a back seat. Are you really astounded? I mean, isn't it a career no, record? I mean, no disrespect, you've announced you're standing down from Congress after this Congress. Isn't it suicide for someone? It is a kind of a suicide mission, isn't it, to run against an incumbent president? You don't get any credit yourself. You're unlikely to win. You damage the party in the process and you end up being on the outside of everything. The only thing you just said that I wholeheartedly disagree with is damaging your party in the process. What damages the party in the process is coronations. What damages the party is the absence of a fair stage on which to any candidate can enter. What damages the party is the suppression of voters, suppression of debate, suppression of candidates. What damages the party is a culture that rewards tenure and does not reward talent. So to everything you just said, no, the answer is you're right. I'm not surprised. I'm appalled. I'm disappointed. I'm repulsed. And I'm on a mission to point out the failures and also do something about it. Let me tell you one more thing, Jerry. This just happened yesterday. The state of Florida, the Democratic Party in Florida, called, as far as I know, an unannounced gathering of its committee officials. And they made the determination that the only name that would appear on the 2024 primary ballot is Joe Biden. Not me, not any of the other candidates who have made application. A handful of people made the decision for millions of Florida Democratic voters. As a result, there is no primary in Florida. They literally decided, a handful of people, that there will be no primary in the state of Florida. You know, this is the United States of America, a democratic republic, the Democratic Party with a big D, literally disenfranchising voters, suppressing candidates, and not allowing a moment of debate. And I find that not just appalling, it's downright dangerous. It's what I say I would expect in Tehran, not in Tallahassee. And that is what's dangerous for the party. Competition is good. It's good in business. It's good in politics, the absence of it leads us to the very circumstances in which we find ourselves right now. The particular problem also, you talked about that, the problem of ballot access that you've got there in Florida, a particular problem, of course, with New Hampshire you've got, and especially in terms of repeating the 1968 precedent, is this time around, of course, New Hampshire, you know, is kind of ostracized by the Democratic Party that the primary is going to go ahead. But of course, because the Democratic Party is changing its rules about its process for the election, didn't like the idea of New Hampshire being the first primary. It it seems quite likely that that whatever happens there won't count, won't matter. Biden's not even on the ballot. There is talk of a sort of a writing campaign for him. As you spend a lot of time in New Hampshire, what are you hearing there? What's the message? What are you expecting from this very strange set of circumstances? Well, what I'm hearing is, of course, from Democratic officials and members of the state party, if you will, and Democratic leaders, they tell one thing, but every voter with whom I'm speaking says something very different. They're appalled. They know that President Biden came in fifth place with 8% of the vote in New Hampshire last time. They know what is really happening. They know that they have a Republican governor who would never have allowed the state to change its first in the nation primary status. And they know that they've been disenfranchised, just like the voters in Florida. 
And Jerry, I've been a lifelong Democrat. I've supported my party since the 20s. I'm a third term member of Congress, former member of House Democratic Leadership. This is a party in which I believe deeply. And what I'm discovering through this last month of pursuit of the presidential nomination is downright shocking. And that's what's happening in New Hampshire right now as well. I find it interesting that the president would change the first in the nation primary and then not be on the ballot, but then inspire a write-in campaign, which we'll see how that goes for him. This is not how politics is supposed to happen in the United States of America, particularly for the Democratic Party. And that is what is deeply troubling to me. This is not going to be a campaign focused on complaints, but I'm going to say the quiet part out loud. I'm going to go expose truths that have heretofore gone unsaid, because exactly like you said, nobody wants to lose their job in Washington. Nobody. And I'm just sickened of a country that is predicated on competition, predicated on meritocracy, predicated on talent, not tenure, being the driver of success. Once we lose that in our politics, in our country, in our economy, I think we have very, very dark days ahead. And I will be exposing the truth. And you know what? I'm going to overcome those because the response so far to my campaign, other than MSNBC, Twitter, and the Washington Beltway, has been extraordinary. And that's the blessing of the United States because we still allow voters to make the final decision, have the final say. It's harder for them in New Hampshire. It's harder for them in Florida. I'm going to be suing the state of Florida, the Democratic Party, I should say, because of their, um, I believe, unconstitutional, unforgivable, and unacceptable decisions. And I will do that on behalf of American voters who deserve a whole lot better. You've made a very strong case against Joe Biden. I think people fair to say Biden remains the sort of prohibitive favorite. There are people making a case against Donald Trump on the Republican side. Trump remains the prohibitive favorite there. There is growing interest, should those two be the nominees of their party, as all the polling suggests they will be, growing interest in a third party nominee. If you don't win the nomination, are you committed to supporting the Democratic candidate, whoever it is? Or would you be interested in yourself, perhaps as a third party candidate. Let's talk about Senator Joe Manchin as a third party. Do you think you would be willing to throw your support behind a third party challenge? Jerry, generally, I would say it's important that we ultimately have competition for the two party system, for the duopoly, because what is occurring right now is tragic for voters. And the answer is ultimately yes. This year is a unique year. I think it's consequential. It could be even existential. I have made it clear, some have asked me to consider that possibility of a third-party candidacy or appearing on a ticket, and I've been very clear. I think over time, we actually need a strong third party. Right now, we need someone to defeat Donald Trump, period. That's why I've called on Cornell West, on Jill Stein, on Senator Manchin, anybody who might enter as an independent and take votes from the eventual Democratic nominee. I've asked that they enter the Democratic primary. That's why we have a primary. So the answer is no. Uh, But over time, do I think that the Democratic and Republican parties need competition? Yes. And I will tell you, after this week alone, what I've discovered happening in Florida, New Hampshire, and other states, that mission will only become more pronounced because the absence of it will lead essentially to the destruction of our democracy. So I will not run as a third-party candidate. I will support the eventual Democratic nominee, and I will do so based on the facts and the data that will indicate who is best positioned to do so. And I would ask that my colleagues voters, Democrats, and others. Follow the truth. Don't listen to politicians who lie. Listen to data, which doesn't. Congressman Dean Phillips, thanks very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate you. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression. Thanks very much for joining us. Be back next week with another episode. In the meantime, have a great week. Thank you and goodbye.